take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Amen. Wonderful, empowering words for us from the writer of Ephesians. I wonder how often we actually see the words of God that we read each Sunday as the sword of the Holy Spirit. And as shoes for our feet, we put on whatever will make us ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. But even equipped with the whole armour of God, so that we may be able to withstand on that evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Doesn't it all feel a little bit daunting? A commitment we might want to go away and think about before committing ourselves to. Jesus recognises that feeling. This teaching is difficult, complain many of his disciples. Who can accept it? Jesus knew from the beginning that this might be the response. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But among you there are some who do not believe. I sense regret, I think, more than anger in those words. Jesus is never without compassion. But in this there is no room for compromise. It is the spirit that gives life. The flesh is useless. No one can come to me unless it is granted by the Father. I look back to where this discourse began. In our time frame, it was five weeks ago, on the 25th of July. In Jesus' time, it was with the miracle, the sign, as John calls it, of the feeding of the 5,000, which we read about on that Sunday. John uses this event to reflect on one of Jesus' great I am statements. I am the bread of life. And he brings together related teaching from, I think, different times and different places into a single chapter. Back in our time frame, we read about Jesus' life in a three-year cycle based on the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke in turn. At the moment, we're in year B. Mostly we're following Mark's rather breathless, action-packed gospel. But for these five weeks, the compilers of the lectionary have chosen to switch to John's rather more reflective narrative. And based on the feeding miracle, the focus is primarily on bread on the basic human need for sustenance. Give us this day our daily bread. But also on bread from heaven, the manna in the wilderness, and Jesus as the bread of life. Yesterday in Ashbury we had a tea party. We gathered in the village hall to thank those who help us to keep the church building in shape. It felt at once wonderful and slightly strange to be back again in a room full of people enjoying themselves. And it must have felt equally strange, I think, for the people who took part in that impromptu picnic that Jesus laid on for them in the wilderness. But Jesus has so much more to offer to his disciples then and to us now. Spiritual food, which once tasted, guarantees that we will never be hungry, never be thirsty again. We 
when I spoke about this a few weeks ago, I described it as the ultimate comfort food. Now I hope these images conjure up something of the wonder, something of the inexpressible joy of following Jesus. But there is a sting in the tail. The discussion of Jesus as bread of life come down from heaven, of eating his flesh, of drinking his blood, inevitably leads to questions about the true nature of Jesus. Fully divine, fully human, some sort of hybrid, or impossibly, at once, fully human and fully divine. The divine spark of creation come down and become flesh and living among us. This teaching, as today's gospel passage reminds us, is difficult. Who can accept it? No one can, easily. Sometimes we have to grapple with uncertainty to fight for the things that we believe in, to fight to believe the things that we know to be right. So I, I think it's not inappropriate that today's epistle is filled with warlike images, which some may no longer find politically correct. The belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation the sword of the Spirit. If you doubt the need for that, look at our TV screens. Where would the refugees fleeing from the Taliban in Afghanistan be without the military forces to maintain some sort of order at Kabul airport? Now it may, through no fault of their own, be late in the day to try to put things right but they will do whatever it takes to get the refugees and only then themselves out to safety. I said earlier that I sensed regret more than anger in Jesus' words to the disciples who fell away. What of his question to Peter and the twelve? Do you also wish to go away? It would be easy, I think, to hear cynicism and expectation that they will let him down. But I'm not sure. Rosalind Brown, whose weekly commentary I hugely value, describes the question as liberating. Having called them to follow, he is now offering a genuine opportunity walk away. Liberating, but not without challenge. There is no cynicism in Peter's reply. They have risen to that challenge, the challenge to fight, to believe what they know to be right. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. That same challenge, to fight, to believe the things we know to be right, is what faces all of us right now. How will we respond? Will we rise to the challenge? Faced with that, I think we can do no better than turn to the words of today's collect and to pray them like we really mean them. Almighty and ever-living God, you are always more ready to hear than we to pray and to give more than either we desire or deserve. 
pour down upon us the abundance of your mercy, forgiving us those things of which our conscience is afraid, and giving us those good things which we are not worthy to ask, but through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and for ever. Amen. Well, thank you for joining me. You will, of course, find the readings that I've mentioned online on our Benefice website. And I hope whatever else you're doing today, you have a wonderful day. Speak to you again soon. Bye now.